Frank Herbert's work in the Dune series was as R.J. Ellis noted, symptomatic of the developing awareness of ecology during the 1950s and 60s. This ecological awareness took on an apocalyptic tone, as shown in the works which heavily influenced Frank Herbert, especially Carson's Silent Spring and Paul Sears' Where There Is Life. The ecological bandwagon was on the move, and much of Herbert's motivations about his theme of the dangerous hero hijacking this movement came from his increasing awareness of the subject, and especially the tone environmentalism was taking. Fear is the mind killer is enshrined in the philosophy of Paul Atreides, and central to Herbert's own concerns over society mindlessly following individuals who used those fears for their own advancement. Herbert was certainly not the first to offer concerns about ecology in science fiction, one of the most popular environmental trends in science fiction up until the 1960s, albeit one that continues today, was that of the ecological disaster novel, of which there are numerous examples amongst quality science fiction and the broader pulp works. The ecological disaster followed in the mode of the Thames Valley disaster novels of the late 19th century, which included works such as W. D. Hayes' The Doom of the Great City, Robert Barr's The Doom of London, Richard Jeffries' After London, and Grant Allen's The Thames Valley Catastrophe. Many of these novels featured apocalyptic scenarios on a localised scale, often by means of some natural environmental disaster of biblical proportions. H. G. Wells's The War of the Worlds follows very much in this vein, describing how the Martians rampage through the Thames Valley area, and is described by the novel's narrator in the form of a travelogue, as the Martians attack the more interesting aspects of the London landscape. The Martians representing man in a higher evolved form, are of course the destructive element here, but it is the arrival of a plant from Mars, the red weed, that seems to cause the most damage to the earth, overwhelming the local indigenous flora. The suggestion is that the plants cover the world of Mars and are what create its red hue. Interpretations vary on its purpose, but the obvious which I believe is that the red weed is part of the invasion and is used to help terraform the earth into a world habitable for the Martians. In the end, the plants succumb to the Earth's bacteria just like the Martian invaders, but they do however represent a very real environmental threat. One notable science fiction work which has a number of similarities to Dune was George R. Stewart's Earth Abides. Stewart's novel of life in America following the devastation of human beings by an apocalyptic plague bears little relationship to Dune on the surface but it does feature some stylistic modes that make similarities between the two works more apparent. Earth Abides features a number of documents intersecting the narrative that discuss the history of mankind from the event of the plague, and represent almost a backward narrative of human civilization. This is reminiscent of the various historical documents that inform the reader in the Dune series, providing them almost with a sense of prescience or future history of the narrative. The story follows the tale of Ish Williams, a graduate student who seemingly survives the devastating plague because of a snake bite he receives, while researching his thesis entitled The Ecology of the Black Creek Area. Ish begins to travel and observes the new quiet world based on his training, occasionally finding small pockets of humanity. Ish, noting how some of the survivors he occasionally meets are failing to cope with this post apocalyptic world, fears for humanity's survival. He eventually settles down and marries a woman he meets called M, and helps found a community that functions as a tribal society. As the years pass, Ish attempts to educate and instill old world knowledge into the new generation being born, who are moving further and further away from the civilization that came before the plague. Eventually he is revered as the last American alive from the old civilization, and he realizes that the old world has truly gone wondering if the new human society can survive. The character of Ish can be looked at almost as a failed messiah, similar to Paul Atreides. Earth abides in its intervening historical documents, takes on a pseudo-religious tone at times, and carries its tale of apocalyptic disaster with a reasoned balance of optimism and pessimism. The tribe, in reverting to the primitive tools such as bows and arrows, rather than the existing firearms which are no longer reliable, 
are learning the skills they need to survive in the post-apocalypse world. This makes them reminiscent of an inversion of the Fremen in Dune. Whereas the Fremen lose their ability to live within the environment after the ecology of Arrakis changes, the generation that follows Ish are learning the skills they need to interact with their environment when all of humanity's technological achievements are slowly fading. Despite balancing the pessimism of a post-apocalyptic world with the optimism of a new generation of human beings learning to adapt to a new environment, Stuart's future world is left for the reader to imagine. Within that ambiguity there is a seed of doubt in the reader's mind, which creates an anxiety that is identifiable with Ellis' viewpoint of apocalyptic ecologism. However, like Dune, Earth Abides is fiction, and therefore can be instructive to the reader without creating any real sense of fear. This apocalyptic ecologism develops throughout the 1960s, and works like Silent Spring and Where There Is Life are clearly indicative of this. They also clearly show the anxiety being generated by such environmental activists in the general public consciousness and the emerging green movement. Ecological writing of the 1970s however is much more representative of the effect of this environmental anxiety. The collective environmental message being produced during this time is one of pessimism and apocalyptic doom. The early 1970s sees a number of such works appearing. One such text first published in The Ecologist was A Blueprint for Survival. The Ecologist had been created in 1970 as a magazine to allow academics to publish radical works on a number of ecological topics. In January of 1972 an entire edition was dedicated to A Blueprint for Survival, later published in book form the same year. The text begins with a statement of support from a range of scientists of the day, before commencing with an introduction presenting the need for change in modern life. In continuing with the traditions of environmental works of the period, it is suitably apocalyptic in tone. The opening statement is as follows. The principal defect of the industrial way of life with its ethos of expansion is that it is not sustainable. Its termination within the lifetime of someone born today is inevitable. The apocalyptic tone and anxiety for the reader is therefore right from the offset, before going on to examine such topics as the destruction of the ecosystem, crop failure, overuse of resources, and ultimately the collapse of society itself. The solution, presented in A Blueprint for Survival, is one of a reductionist tribal society, not altogether different from that presented in Stuart's Earth Abides. That is to say, small agrarian communities with little industrialization and a removal from central authority are seen as an ideal means by which humanity may survive the impending disaster. The need for social change is impacted upon the reader by a reinforcement of the apocalyptic tone, ever suggestive that if such change does not occur, humanity will muddle our way to extinction. Another key text to impact on the 1970s social awareness of ecological problems was The Limits to Growth, a report created for the Club of Rome's project on the predicaments of humanity. The Club of Rome was formed in April 1968 and was essentially a collection of prominent ecologists, economists, scientists, industrialists and educators. The authors of this report were Donella H. Meadows, Dennis L. Meadows, Jürgen Randers and William W. Behrens III. The purpose of the report was to model a number of global trends that were of concern to the Club of Rome and did so using the World 3 computer simulation model. The purpose of this was to investigate five key areas, namely accelerating industrialization, rapid population growth, widespread malnutrition, depletion of non-renewable resources and a deteriorating environment. The World 3 model was essentially a simplified mathematical computer modelling system inappropriately used to represent five incredibly complex and dynamic systems. The conclusion of the report is that all five of these modelled areas of concern are increasing exponentially and advocates limiting growth to create a sustainable equilibrium. If this is not done on a global scale, then humanity will reach the limits of growth on planet Earth within the next 100 years.
Once again, we have an ecological report that recognises sufficient trends in the environment and mankind's interactions with it to provide a stark, pessimistic, and apocalyptic tone to its readership before offering solutions to the problems in question. The Club of Rome's report in The Limits to Growth does present a number of possible solutions to the results created by their simplified computer model, and they differ from a blueprint for survival in that they advocate a global response and the need to see responsible development of third world countries. Despite these differences, we still see here the need for anxiety and fear to motivate the public into avoiding the forthcoming environmental apocalypse. Another work, again in the same year as these reports, was Only One Earth, The Care and Maintenance of a Small Planet by Barbara Mary Ward and René Dubois. Only One Earth was created for the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm. In May of 1971, Dr. René Dubois was commissioned by Maurice F. Strong, the then Secretary General of the conference, to chair a group of 152 scientific and intellectual experts who would contribute as consultants to the report. The report is then authored by Wards and Dubois, but the result of a much larger collaborative effort. Primarily of concern to the report is the world of mankind, seen as a separate created environment that is distinct and at odds with that of the natural world. The introduction of the report notes some of the criticisms made at the time, some seeing it as pessimistic and others as optimistic. This is certainly a trend of these ecological writings, the pessimism creating the anxiety to then allow the advocacy of a philosophical approach which will optimistically allow humanity to survive the impending disaster. One such comment appearing in the introduction even makes the comparison of fear-mongering to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Some of the consultants feel that the general tone of Only One Earth is far too pessimistic, and they see no justification in reporting on the present state of the world as if it were a fear story. One of them, indeed, sees in the style all the defects he violently objects to in Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, emotional and non-factual. Like the Club of Rome's report, Only One Earth focuses on five key topics, namely the current state of the world, science issues such as nuclear power, the development of high technology, the developing world, and the planetary biosphere. The report does emphasise the need for stewardship and sometimes views mankind in more religious overtones than as a scientific exercise, but the end result is the same. The ability of humanity to survive is brought into question, especially in the light of the nuclear arms race. Similarly to the Club of Rome's report, there is no suggestion of technological abandonment or the need to regress into tribal society, but rather the emphasis on global cooperation and responsibility. Interestingly enough, the report comments at the end if this will happen in almost pseudo-science fiction tones, noting that there is not a planetary authority, or indeed, loyalty. But the idea of authority and energy and resources to support their policies seems strange, visionary, and utopian at present, simply because world institutions are not backed by any sense of planetary community and commitment. The tone of the report in Only One Earth is to an extent slightly more optimistic and more rational than those mentioned above, as it is mitigated perhaps a little unusually with a degree of Christian optimism, suggesting planetary community and love may well help us solve our problems. Nevertheless, it too carries the pessimism of an impending ecological disaster brought about by humanity's misuse of science, technology, and the environment itself. As such, it follows the trend Ellis describes inherent to apocalyptic ecologism, fear generating pessimism, followed by solutions that create optimism with just enough doubt to maintain anxiety. Small is Beautiful A Study of Economics as If People Mattered by Ernst Friedrich Schumacher, the German born economist and statistician, provides a series of essays structured into four categories namely the modern world, resources, the third world, and organisation and ownership. Schumacher looks at the problems arising from modern day production systems created by developments over the recent centuries by philosophical and religious attitudes 
which are connected with mankind's attitude to nature. Schumacher views natural resources in terms of economics as not being defined as part of income, but rather as part of natural capital and therefore finite. Again, in the trend of the ecological catastrophe, he presents the notion that people are waking up to these realities which may threaten life itself, and questions why terms such as pollution, ecology, and environment are suddenly coming into prominence in the general public's awareness. Schumacher's solutions to the looming problems lie to a degree in the developments of small technologies and an improvement of the way of life for mankind. His concept of Buddhist economics stands opposed to the levels of consumption in modern capitalist societies, where more is better and the level of consumption dictates the level of individual happiness. Such a modern economic viewpoint looks at labour as merely a means to an end to generate income, and therefore a cost of doing business. Schumacher states that the Buddhist viewpoint of economics from this perspective has a different attitude to work in that it will give a man a chance to utilise and develop his faculties to enable him to overcome his ego-centeredness by joining with other people in a common task, and to bring forth the goods and services needed for a becoming existence. To Schumacher, modern economic attitudes view the ownership and consumption of goods as a means to an end, and a way in which one can tally and measure the standard of living. Modern economics to Schumacher is unable to distinguish between renewable and non-renewable resources, merely seeing all things as the sole end and purpose of all economic activity. Small is Beautiful proposes a rational and conservative approach to consumption, something which ideally uses the least amount of resources, least effort, and the least destruction to attain the best possible output. Understanding the difference between resources which are finite, natural capital, and those which are renewable is essential to Buddhist economics, and strongly urges the necessity for local production of local resources for local needs. Schumacher's work combines the ideal use of technology with a proper ethos towards consumption of resources. Through this, he expresses the need to realise that certain resources are finite and irreplaceable, combined with the idea that damage to nature is not sustainable either. Schumacher's tone takes a stand against human greed as the major problem of our time, and that our environmental concerns are emerging from the consequences of that greed. Considerably less fearful in tone, Small is Beautiful nevertheless does conclude with a dire apocalyptic warning in the epilogue, warning as it does of the threat that unless you seek first the kingdom of God, these other things which you also need will cease to be available to you. There is a great deal in these ecological works that we can see being represented in Herbert's Dune series. Unfortunately the tone of this apocalyptic ecology seems to be a means of garnering public attention and approval for the concerns of the growing environmental movement of the time. As Ellis notes, the Dune series is mapping fictionally the discursive modes within which the ecological debate about America's future was being conducted. As such, perhaps one of the reasons for the enduring attention it receives is because as much as it too may be a long term representation of apocalyptic ecology, through the medium of science fiction a different tone is generated. The Dune series and George R. Stewart's Earth Abides alike are able to present these growing ecological and environmental concerns through entertainment, removing the anxiety and fear that ecological writing was instilling on the wider general public. The success of Dune owes much to the developing popular awareness of environmental issues emerging out of the 1960s. Dune stands apart from many other works of science fiction which feature environmental disasters, rather than any real observation or exploration of ecological and environmental issues. However, the continued success of Dune, despite initially being rejected by so many publishers, has led to further developments in science fiction, and meant that the ecological science fiction novel has been allowed to grow up maturing in a manner that shows it has left behind its environmental catastrophe predecessors. <laughs>
June's popular and critical success as a work of ecological science fiction has opened the door for other authors to explore contemporary environmental issues in a more considered fashion other than the apocalyptic natural disaster. Such works surely include Sherry S. Tepper's Grass, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy and the Orange County Trilogy, Adam Roberts's Salt, and Joan Slonczewski's own response to June itself, A Door into Ocean. Much of A Door into Ocean reflects my responses to Frank Herbert's June and to Ursula Le Guin's The Word for World is Forest. June depicts a world covered entirely by desert. To a biologist, the limitations of such a world are clear. No desert ecosystem can exist without moisture evaporated from ocean and carried by air currents. It was a natural step to imagine the opposite, a world covered entirely by water, which the Earth may well have been early in our planet's history. June depicts several male dominated societies whose members scheme and oppress one another. The psychology of the characters is compelling and study of it was helpful for me. Nevertheless, the societies in June are all limited to those dominated by males and violence. Even the female Bene Gesserit use violent means and direct most of their scheming towards manipulation of males. Thus, in Ocean I attempted to oppose the June concept by depicting ocean dwelling females in non-violent revolution who succeed without losing their humanity, as Paul and the Fremen sadly do. Slonczewski's viewpoint here presents a critical stance of Dune in terms of its accurate scientific depiction of the ecology of Arrakis. It is a viewpoint that fails to observe the details of Herbert's work, and looking at Dune itself as an isolated text rather than part of a larger intended sequence. From the very beginning of conceiving Dune, Herbert's intent and conception was to subvert the reader's viewpoint of the hero and the messianic convulsions that periodically overtake us. Herbert spent some six years researching Dune, and the writing process took one and a half years, but from the outset the whole story was conceived as a long novel, the whole trilogy as one book. During the writing of Dune, Herbert noted the work was getting bigger and bigger, and at one point informed his agent Lurton Blasingham that it might reach over a million words. He finally started putting his worries aside and worked from a bottom up approach determining where the story needed to go and what he desired to achieve with the final product. In doing this, Herbert said, I started building from the back. Where does it have to go? So parts of Children of Dune and Dune Messiah were already written before I completed Dune. It is therefore necessary to always examine the first Dune trilogy as a collective whole, rather than as separate entities. If one does not do this, as a number of commentators have, then they miss Frank Herbert's very deliberate, long term rhythm in Dune. The inversion of Herbert's Dune series truly begins with Dune Messiah, where to our horror we discover that Paul Moadib Atreides as Emperor has unleashed the Fremen upon a jihad which has resulted in the slaughter of billions, and the beginnings of what will be in terms of ecological time, a swift and sudden transformation of the environment of Arrakis. Slonczewski's view of the limitations of Herbert's Arrakis as a fully realised and plausible ecosystem is based on the fact that the vast deserts of this strange world cannot be conceived without moisture evaporated from ocean and carried by air currents. Arrakis is a world that has had its original ecosystem fully transformed by the arrival of an introduced species. And indeed, in Children of Dune, we are told by Leto II that it was once a wet planet, where now the white gypsum pans attested to bygone lakes and seas. In the first appendix of Dune, entitled The Ecology of Dune, there is much more information readily available to the reader, and again, Slonczewski, in her above remarks, seems unaware of its content. In beginning his ecological surveys of the planet's ecosystem, when observing from the air after being accidentally blown off course, Pardot Kynes realises that this desert world was once a world that contained much surface water. When the storm passed, there was the Pan, a giant oval depression some 300 kilometres on the long axis 
a glaring white surprise in the open desert. Kynes landed, tasted the pan's storm-clean surface. Salt. Now, he was certain. There had been open water on Arrakis, once. He began re-examining the evidence of the dry wells where trickles of water had appeared and vanished, never to return. Ecologically speaking, there is more to Arrakis than meets the eye of the casual observer, and it is perhaps for this reason alone that its popularity remains undiminished, despite lacklustre interest from the critical science fiction community. Slonczewski's distaste for violence in Dune, perpetuated as she sees it by male-orientated societies, and to a certain extent by the female Bene Gesserit, also demonstrates a lack of understanding of Herbert's intent and again a failure to examine the Dune series as a whole. As a female school, the Bene Gesserit are the main representation of women in the Imperium, and with some exceptions, most female characters are members of this secretive order. But again there is no consideration of either the God Emperor's all-female army of fish speakers, or the honoured matres from Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune. Violence is not the key to understanding Paul Atreides or the Fremen, and it is interesting to note that Slonczewski believes that both lose their humanity because of it. In actuality, the Fremen are reduced to their museum status because of the loss of the harsh Arrakis environment, which makes them soft, and is a comment more on the process of natural selection and the conditions for the so-called survival of the fittest. Paul's failure as the Kwisatz Satirach is not that he loses his humanity, but that he is actually incapable of losing it. He is unable to bring about the golden path that he initiates because a part of him is incapable of inflicting so much death and destruction on mankind, but fundamentally because he cannot give up his humanity to do so. It is Leto II who truly understands what terrible sacrifice is required to create the golden path and his symbiosis with the sand trout creates the inhuman transformation necessary to see the evolutionary plan through. Violence however is in one sense key to understanding Herbert's approach to ecology in the Dune series, believing as he did that force was the key tool of western man in dealing with any given problem, and especially in the general terms of his approach to living and interacting with his environment. We play the game today with counters called money, and we talk about laws of supply and demand and so on. There is a law of supply and demand, and there is no problem which won't submit to this approach, even the problem of our own ignorance. This assumption, you see, throws it out the window right there, because it is an asinine assumption, and the basic fallacy of western man's approach to living. Now, I'm not saying that we should immediately drop this and adopt a Vedanta way of thinking. We need what I would call a science of wisdom. The moral norm, as I try to show in Dune, is something imposed upon people by their environment. Ethical law takes a step in another direction and it says that I, the thinking animal, see the logical consequences of these moral actions and maybe I'd better modify the moral law slightly by a higher ethical law. Dune shows the conflict between absolutes and the necessity of the moment. You might say it is an exercise in showing up the fallacy of absolutism. <laughs>